Hey everybody, my name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Brittany Doherty. She's a civil engineer by training and her background or her discipline that she that is land development. And she told me that uh, that, that, that land development is actually rather rare, so I'm interested to learn more about that. And then she also has passed the PE exam, and I know how difficult that exam is because I did it a few years ago, so I'll ask her about that too. And then I'll, then we'll get into public speaking, of course, because that's kind of what this whole uh, podcast is about. So <laughs> welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Brittany. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Neil. Wonderful. First question, where'd your interest in civil engineering come from? So actually, um, it started pretty young. I've always loved uh, engineering or science and math, but I was actually really afraid of bridges when I was younger. Um, anytime we'd have to like go on trips, uh, we live in California. So we'd go to like San Francisco and have to like go over the Bay Bridge and um, I was terrified. So I was like, well, you know, when you're afraid of something, if you learn more about it, normally that'll like help your fears. So I decided to go into engineering. I wanted to do uh, bridges and um, that's kind of how I got started. And then I took my first statics class and we had to build like a small bridge and I liked the class, but after kind of learning more about it, I decided that wasn't really what, it, what I wanted to do with my career and kind of change gears while I was in college. But um, yeah, that's where it all started was like my 12 year old self that was afraid of bridges. <laughs> wow, that's interesting uh, yeah. that your fear of bridges is what prompted you to study essentially bridges. I'm yep. afraid of rats. There's no way in hell I'm, I'm studying them. <laughs> well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely afraid of spiders, and there's no way I'm going to learn anything about spiders. I can't even <laughs> go near them. But, but it was a little different. But <laughs> right. yeah. All right. I'm no longer afraid of bridges, though, after learning. You know, we built this little like balsa wood bridge. It was like this big, and it held like hundreds of pounds, you know. So I was like, okay, well, if this little like twig thing can hold up hundreds of pounds. I think this actual steel bridge that was designed by real engineers, you know, will be fine. So it actually did work. <laughs> right. Well, you know what? It was, it was probably a good idea to get over the fear of bridges or else you might be stuck in your house. <laughs> the whole right. place you couldn't, you couldn't go with <laughs> me, but you know, the fear of fear of rats, I just, you know, stay out of, stay out of areas with rats, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, you know, I also, you know, you mentioned, well, I mentioned in the intro that your, your, your discipline is land development. And I, I was just curious, what, what exactly does land development mean? What does that entail? So land development is actually like the, when you uh, are in industry and you say like you need a civil engineer, most of the time they're actually referring to a land development engineer uh, when you're trying to build a house or a subdivision or anything like that. So we actually do all the groundwork. Um, so we're slightly different than a geotechnical engineer. They do everything below ground, um, like the soils and stuff. We do all the grading of the ground. Uh, we do pipe layout for all your utilities, water, sewer, um, storm drain, and then uh, all the grading. Like, so we lay out the houses and subdivisions and, um, and design your driveways and curb and gutter and, and all that stuff that starts before they actually start building up. Oh, okay, well, that, that makes sense. And, yeah. and so when, when it comes to, to land development, is that something that you realized you wanted to do in school or did you graduate and then kind of fell in, kind of fall into land development? So they actually didn't have any courses in land development. Um, they didn't teach it and most colleges that I know of don't really have a really wide variety of land development courses and uh, most places don't even offer it as a discipline. You kind of have to choose between like water, transportation, uh, geotechnical, structural, and there's one more, uh, or construction. And so it's not even really one of the disciplines. They don't offer it on the PE. Um, so I just graduated. I kind of focused to water. Uh, after I learned, I didn't really want to do structural in college. And I took a lot of water resources classes. And then when I graduated, I just kind of took the first job that would ha have me, you know, when you're graduated, you're, you're like, I'll just take anyone who's willing to offer me a job. Right. And it was doing and engineering and I loved it. I loved all the grading and um, it's a lot of CAD work and you get to visit your sites and so it's a good combination of being in the office at the computer and uh, getting to go out to client meetings and, and look at your site and kind of see what's going on there. So I really enjoyed the balance of, of that discipline. So 
another thing that I, I learned just from doing some research on you, you said you, you actually worked as a drafter while you were in school. How were you able to balance working and going to school? Um, that was definitely difficult. I, I actually started working uh, my freshman year. I took the first semester and just focused on college. But then uh, the second semester, I had run out of my money that I saved up uh, from working summers and stuff. So I started working at a, um, just like a Cabela's, it's called Shields, it's pretty local to here, but it's like a Cabela's Bass Pro Shop sporting goods store. And so I started actually working there and um, just, it, I was used to it. You know, I, I took about like 30 credits a semester, 30 units a semester and uh, worked pretty much the whole time and then took summer classes to help catch up because I wasn't able to take like a, you know, a super large course load but I needed the money. So, you know, you kind of just make it work. And then um, my sophomore year, I believe I, I took a drafting class and I had actually taken drafting all throughout high school. I took four years of it in my high school and um, I loved it. So when I had to take my class in college, I pretty much knew, you know, most of the basics. I had taken four years of it already. And my professor, um, <laughs> I, he was super sarcastic and, and that's my personality as well. So I would give him a hard time when he would like do things and I'm like, oh, that doesn't look very good. You should like fix that, you know, just messing with them. And uh, he's the one who actually recommended me to an engineering company saying, hey, I have this drafter. She's really great. Um, she's top of my class and she's super sarcastic. So she's going to fit in great with you guys. And he's the one who recommended me uh, to this company. And I worked there pretty much throughout uh, my college career and then my senior year I switched uh, I got my first job as an engineer so um, it was great I I definitely thought it was a struggle uh, balancing the, my course load and my work but I think the important thing is finding a company that is supportive and they're all engineers too they understand you know so during finals and stuff like that they would give me time off to, to study and make sure that I do pass my classes Oh, wow. So when it came to working as a drafter, are you, are you talking working just regular full-time hours? No, I was working um, between 20 to 30 hours a week, depending on the semester and how many classes I was taking. And then over the summer, I was working full-time hours. Uh, but pretty much every summer, I took two to three summer classes. So uh, the summers were actually busier than the regular semester. Oh, okay. So you'd go to class during the, maybe you go to class during the day and then you do your drafting job, you know, in the evenings? Yeah, so uh, based off of my schedule, I would uh, like work maybe like in the morning and then I'd have like evening classes or I'd have like morning classes some days and I'd work in the evenings and then there was like one or two days a week that I would actually like go into work at like 7 a.m. work, head to class for a couple hours and then come back and work till like 6 p.m. So oh, um, wow. yeah, it was <laughs> it was a lot. But I mean, I, I graduated with very few student loans. Uh, because of it, you know, I was able to afford some cost of living and, and to be able to buy all my books. And so I, I didn't have to put a ton on uh, loans, which really helped out when you're graduating and you don't just have that like burden of huge amounts of debt. You know, I still graduated with some, but definitely not the full cost of, of tuition. Wow. I, I, you know what? I, I did four years of engineering school too. And just the idea of working while doing it just it never even crossed my mind. I, I don't know if I could have done it. I, I struggled <laughs> through school. So the fact that you were able to, to do school and, and work at the same time, I, I commend you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was not easy. Um, there were definitely times that I wanted to quit. <laughs> I think every engineer goes through that, whether they're working or not. But there's times, you know, when you're like, this is just too hard. Like, I don't have it in me. And uh, that's, you just have to have the support system around you. I, I have my now husband that I was dating back then. And he was, he was huge with that, just helping me like work through it and telling me, you know, this isn't permanent. Like you just have to like take it one day at a time. And that definitely helped. But yeah, I, I love my job. And I definitely think working as a drafter gave me some great insight and helped me get a great job out of college because I had already had experience working in an engineering firm and knew what a set of plans are supposed to look like and everything like that. So it definitely helped. Okay. And it you know, I also mentioned in the intro that you got your PE, and I, I know from experience that that's not an easy test. What motivated you to get your PE? So in um, some fields, you know, like some mechanical engineers and uh, other engineers, uh, PE isn't really necessary. They're able to really work in their discipline without having to get it. But in development, you pretty much need your PE um, 
but people expect you to get it pretty much after after that like four year mark they're expecting you to kind of move on um especially because you know at my company we have the like main engineer our principal that stamps most of the plans but then the other stamping engineers they'll stamp their own plans you're able to work on your own projects and stamp your own plans and so it's just something that it wasn't really like a should I get it it was more of a okay what do I need to do to start pursuing it I never really thought of it as an option um, and I'm actually I'm actually two months away from getting my actual stamp so in I'm in Nevada and you're actually able to take your PE before you hit that four years of experience which is really great but uh, so I've passed my PE I've done all the paperwork I'm literally just waiting out the clock for the next two months before I can apply for my stamp oh, okay you know, you you mentioned other disciplines that are able to to work without having a PE, and I'm one of those people. Actually, I worked in in medical devices, and I don't think I don't know of any person that, had, that was an engineer in medical devices that had their PE. The only reason I got it was because, you know what? Like you're thinking about, it, I don't even know why I got it. <laughs> it made absolutely no sense. I I remember reading about it one day online. I was like, oh, this this sounds interesting. Yeah, I, I I took it as a challenge, really. And yeah. so I did the, you know, I did the FE exam and then I did the PE exam after and then just, okay. So now I have a PE, but I, I do absolutely nothing with it. But as you <laughs> mentioned, <laughs> with, but with you, uh, you know, in, in I, I think, I think I actually knew that too, but in civil engineering, it's more, requ more of a requirement than anything, you know, just mm -hmm. mentioned to, 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 you know, to sign your own plans and just probably even for promotion and just moving up in a, within a company. I'm sure it's a lot easier to do when you have your PE, right? Oh, definitely. And when you're looking at jobs, you'll either see, you see two categories. You see that they're looking for a lower level uh, entry engineer that has their EIT, their engineer in training. Uh, so you have to pass your FE before you graduate for that. And then, um, or they're asking for someone with their PE or the ability to obtain their PE within six months or less. And those are like the two main levels. And then obviously there's senior engineers that they're looking more for project management roles and to lead a team. But um, those are the main levels that I see, especially when you're looking for a job. So uh, I think it's really important, especially in, in the civil discipline, to have your stamp if you do want to move up to those higher positions. Yeah, for sure. So in the job that you do now, what is the, I guess, the, your, your favorite part about it and what's your least favorite part about it? <laughs> um, my favorite part is probably the problem solving uh, we start with this blank piece of land. So um, my company, I should start with, uh, we do all land development for uh, large subdivisions. So that's like our main client is working with developers here and they bring to us houses that they want to build. And we have this blank piece of land, multiple acres of land, and we have to create subdivisions, houses for like where you and I live. So um we have to really like take in so many different factors like the surrounding grades and what the general slope of the land is and and just trying to make this like final product out of nothing you know just dirt and so it's i love it because no two projects are the same even if you're building the same exact subdivision in two different locations you're going to have different complications and different problems one might have like a stream running through it that you have to like figure out how to build around or like fill in or redirect the water. And so it's, it's really interesting because your days are different. Every single day you're doing something different. You're um, experiencing something new. You have different problems to solve. So it's never boring. Um, but then one of the downsides I think to my specific job is doing subdivisions <laughs> um, because it is very repetitive. Once you have the general grading down and you're like putting in like, the plot plan so uh, when you go to buy a new house they have like little pieces of paper that have your house with the fence and the grades and the driveway and everything like that well we have to create one of those for all you know the hundreds of houses on a single property so once you kind of get that basic grading in doing the plot plans is probably uh, a little bit more on like the repetitive boring side but again you know it is you do have like individual challenges with that. So that's probably my high and low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, I also found out that you, well, you, I, yeah, I definitely found out that you have a podcast. What's your podcast about? So uh, my podcast actually isn't related to engineering at all. I have a podcast on um, two of them, actually, one on pregnancy and one on parenting. 
Um, so they're called the Growing Our Family podcast. And I really focus on uh, providing evidence-based information to parents so they can make their own decisions. Um, I, I'm very analytical and I'm super into like research and uh, doing all that. So when I first got pregnant with my son, um, I didn't really know anything about pregnancy or parenting like most parents, you know, I, I had never really been around kids. So I just kind of took to the internet and I found so much conflicting information on there. And it's really confusing because, you know, it's like one, one place is telling you this and then another website is like telling you com something completely different. And you're like, well, who do I listen to? So I started like doing research and I found very reputable sites, you know, like uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics and like other, you know, societies like that. And I just started doing my research from there. And I'm like, I'm spending hours doing all this research. I should share it with other parents. You know, I've already done all the work. Why not just create a podcast so I can help other people out? So it's kind of where it started. And I love it. I love talking about kids and babies and parenting and interviewing other professionals in the field. It's, it's a really great experience. Wow. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right. Pregnancy and parenting have absolutely nothing to do with engineering. <laughs> I, know, I know nothing about either. <laughs> well, I didn't either before I got pregnant. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, you know what? But I think what you're doing is typical of an engineer, I would think, is trying to find you know, data and just, you know, the facts about, you know, child rearing. That's how smart because, I don't know, I think I read somewhere, just like you said, that there's a lot of conflicting information out there. I think I read somewhere that, you know, when a, if a, a baby's crying, you know, you'll have two schools of thought. There's the one where you have, you're you supposed to pick it up when it's crying. And then there's the other school of thought where you let it like soothe itself. So you just let, you let it like leave it mm -hmm. or leave the kid there. So I'm out of curious, out of curiosity, which is, which is the correct course of action? Um, like most things with parenting, I think it totally depends on the situation. Uh, we've, we've done both as parents. You know, if, if your kid is, um, happy and they're crying because they are just having like a temper tantrum and they want like a cookie and you're like no sorry like you don't get that right now you have to eat your dinner first and they like start to have a full-on fit sometimes you do just let them cry and you get their emotions out you know they're humans just like us they're just tiny humans that can't really express themselves so um, I think it definitely depends but if they're crying because they're hungry or they need a diaper change or something like that, then absolutely like go right to them, pick them up. So it definitely depends on the situation. And that's, that's the confusing part that is hard for a lot of analytical people is there is no right answer. You know, it's, it's like English. <laughs> like that's how I define it. Math and science is very straightforward. You have X and Y and you like put it into an equation and you have a solution versus parenting and, and other things like, you know, like English to me, it's like there's multiple right answers and you have to figure out which one is best for your specific situation. Yeah, I remember when I was in high school, English was probably one of my least favorite subjects because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically had to, especially I remember my, my, my senior year, and this, this, this still, when you're thinking about it, kind of annoys me. So we had a teacher <laughs> and I was doing really well in the class and then he left for some reason. I think he got sick. And so we had a, a, a substitute and this guy was a complete jerk. I, I, I couldn't get a good, a good grade in this guy's class. And I remember thinking, this guy's only here a few, a few months. This is my last year of high school. I'm trying to get good grades to, you know, go, go apply to college and stuff. And man, I was like, I'm just trying to give this guy the answer he wants to hear. But I often was wrong. Whatever I said was what he wanted to, hear, what he wanted to read. I was like, damn, man. I was like, this is engineering thing. I think it's going to it have to work out. So this, right? whole, this whole English thing, I don't know, man. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, so you know, I, no, so so now we're gonna move on to the, I guess the the public speaking portion of the of the interview. I'm really I won't. I mean, the main reason I started this whole podcast is because I struggled with public speaking and I had to do it every month in front of management, and I was terrible at it at first. But I saw the benefit of getting better at it over time. You know, being able to take you know technical information that engineers have and and distilling it in such a way that non-technical people will actually listen to and understand is is an, is an art really i mean it, it's not it's not all that easy so i guess my, my first question for you is is public speaking been something that you've always been good at and if not what have you done to get better at it so i've always been okay with being in front of people i think that's the first step is just being comfortable in front of others whether you're speaking or not um i i was a cheerleader in high school so you know every friday night we were down in front of a whole stadium of people and 
out there and it's different being alone versus in a group. You have that like pack mentality where you don't feel as like exposed. Um, I probably, my first actual public like speech that I had to give was in high school. I uh, was in a pageant um, for my community. I was in it for the scholarship money. They offered a thousand dollars towards uh, your school. So I'm like, you know, I need all the help I can get with paying for this college thing. I don't have a talent. I don't really know what I'm doing. I've never done this before. And I'm definitely not the pageant type of person, but I'm going to do it. You know, I, I wanted to put myself out there and it was more of like a personal goal. And part of the competition was giving a speech in front of a whole crowd of people. And you were out there completely alone on the stage and you had a microphone and you had to stand there and like give your spiel about who you were and what you wanted to do and what you wanted to accomplish in your life. And it was difficult. It was so hard being out there, very nerve wracking. Um, but the biggest thing is practice. Um, when I finally got to college, we had to take all engineers at my school are required to take an engineering communications class, which is absolutely, uh, if your school doesn't require it, I would recommend it to every engineer out there because um, it's so beneficial. We had to give speeches and then every speech that we gave in the class was recorded. And then you had to go back through and critique yourself and count how many times you said, um, in your speech and how many times, um, you put your hands up here by your face and, and we're like covering your mouth as you're talking and your posture and everything. Like you had to write like a report on the way that you gave a presentation and we're our big, biggest critics. So like I was way harder on myself than probably any teacher would have been. But once you're aware of those things and you see some of your habits, you become like subconsciously aware. So now whenever I'm talking, if I do say, um, I like cringe because it's like ingrained in my brain. I've heard myself say it so many times. Uh, when I first started the class, I think my first speech, I said, um, upwards of like 40 or 50 times, like something absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and by the end of the class, I think I said it like four times in my, in my like final interview. You just kind of learn how to like naturally pause and, and come up with ideas without having to have those filler words. So um, it definitely was a process. I, I was not great at public speaking to start off with. It, it's definitely practice makes perfect kind of thing. I, I think if you're not used to talking in front of people, it can be really intimidating, but um, there's definitely, definitely opportunities out there. And I just said, um, and, and I like, <laughs> I notice every time I say it. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, ah, uh, you know, so all those filler words, it, and you're right, if you, when you videotape yourself and you actually look at it, you oftentimes don't even realize how often you say those words, because we say them a lot just in regular speaking, just outside, you know, conversationally, but when you actually have to see yourself on the video doing it, and you're thinking, man, that's, that's a lot of ums. <laughs> oh, yeah. And if you're not aware of it, it probably doesn't bother you, even when other people do it, but those people that are aware of it you know like I am very uh aware of when people say um so when I do listen to other interviews or podcasts and they say it a lot it it's hard to listen to because you just like <laughs> start to like focus in on all the ums like you know like have a mental count going be like oh my gosh does this person like say anything else besides um <laughs> you know what you're like my mom my mom is the exact same way so my mother actually she called me one day and she was commenting on one of these interviews that I did a few months ago and she said that I did a pretty good job but she said she couldn't listen to the person that I was interviewing because he said um so often right. I was like, are you serious like the guy he, he said some good stuff but he's like no no all those damn ums man I, I, could, get, I could get past it <laughs> yeah it's a blessing and a curse because it'll make you a better speaker but it will make everyone else seem like a worse speaker <laughs> <laughs> that's something <laughs> So another question that I have about public speaking, do you have a process when it comes to preparing presentations? And if so, what is it? Definitely. So I really just start off with um, a draft. I like to create an outline of what I'm going to say, my intro, outro, and that's everything. Like from every single podcast interview I do versus having to give a presentation at work or have a client meeting. Um, I really like to have the paper and write down everything I want to say. And then I'll kind of go through those topics in my mind and figure out what kind of process I want to make with them, how I want to connect all my different ideas. And then I'll 
practice, like, especially when I was starting out with public speaking. Now I don't really have to, I kind of go through all of those processes in my mind, but I don't have to actually go through the same, you know, steps and like really draw them out. But when I was first starting, it definitely helps to go through that process, practice your interview at least one time out loud in a mirror so you can watch yourself. And, and it really helps figure out where your flaws are and where you're going to have trouble with tying two pieces of information together. And I think it's invaluable to go through that, especially at the beginning stages of, of public speaking or having meetings with other people. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Practice makes progress. And I also agree with having a draft when you, when you want to put something together. It helps with just being able to organize the ideas in, in a logical way, in a way that people can easily follow. Oh, when definitely. I first, yeah, when I first started, when I first started doing speeches or presentations at work, I was arrogant and I would just get up there and, and wing it. And it was terrible. I slept through all my shirts. But no, but now I, I definitely, I, I'm a lot better at it. I have some sort of structure and I, I fully agree with you. A draft is, is invaluable. And I feel like with some people that are very analytical and we understand the numbers, we understand the processes it's easy to get distracted. You know, you start talking about something and that your mind is constantly moving. It's, it's never just a straight line of progress in, in your brain. And if you're not used to public speaking, it's really easy to get sidetracked. Be like, okay, well, these are the numbers. Oh, and this is how I came about them. And these are the cool formulas I used. And this is like my thought process on it. But other people don't really care about your thought processes, which <laughs> sounds kind of mean, but you know, if you're not in this field and it's not what you're passionate about, they don't care how you got to the solution or how you got to the answer. They just care about what the results are and how that affects them. And understanding that as a consultant is really important because your client doesn't care how you got to the numbers. They care about money and they care about timelines and they care about when their final product is going to be delivered. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Time and money, man. <laughs> like right? I, don't, I don't give a shit about all those stuff. Tell me yeah. how much it costs and tell me how long it's going to take. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And always start with, okay, here's the solution to the problem that we have. You know, you want to let them know you don't want to lead with all the problems and then go on with your solutions later. You want to be like, hey, these are the solutions we found for the problems that came up. <laughs> hey, that's smart. Because yeah. <laughs> you, you hit them with all the problems, they, they get stressed real quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see their eyes glaze over and they're like calculating how much this is going to cost in their mind. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> they start sweating. <laughs> That's funny. Do you ever get nervous when it comes to public speaking? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? Not as much anymore, just after practicing a lot. I think also it depends on what you're talking about. My, when you don't really know what you're talking about or you're not very experienced in it, it can be extremely nerve wracking for anyone. So I think the biggest tip is just to really dive in deep to what you're gonna talk about. Don't just cover what you plan to talk about because people will start asking questions and then having to answer those questions is I feel like just as big of a part of your interview or your speech as what you plan to say. You know, because if someone asks you a question, to, can you explain that a little further or you know, a specific question, especially analytical, um, being able to respond to those efficiently and and quickly is just as important as your original speech. Yeah, so you know I, what? yeah. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, yeah. So preparing, you know, not just what you're going to say, but really kind of think about what, what people could ask questions or even Google, you know, what are some common questions for this and looking through other threads and, and figuring out what your response would be beforehand. You know what? That's excellent advice, being able to anticipate questions. And I'm sure by doing that, it certainly would help to minimize those nerves. And I'm a big fan of the, I don't know, I'm the one that came up with this. I like to think I did, but probably not. <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a big proponent of believing that being nervous before a presentation is normal. And it's normal because it's it actually, it, what's the best way to say this? It shows that you actually care about what you're talking about. Oh yeah, you and care. I meant show through. Yeah, for sure, and you know, and I think that's really important when it comes to public speaking. I remember when I was in high school, and I and when I was in English class actually, and we had to do debates where it was a pro and con side. You were assigned to a side, and you had to argue that side. I was terrible at it because mm -hmm. if I didn't actually believe what I was talking about, I wasn't able to convince anybody that 
they should believe what I was saying. Oh, definitely. It, I would be terrible on a debate team because, you know, if you're not passionate about what you're talking about, I feel like a lot of people can be very monotone, very uh, like boring, and it's hard to listen to. It's hard to retain that information when they're not engaging with the audience. And if you don't believe what they're saying, it's really hard to feel interested in it as well. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that, you know, things that you want the people listening to know about, you know, things you're working on? Um, not, not really. Just, I feel like anyone who's pursuing their engineering degree or if, um, you're already got your degree and you're working on like trying to get your stamp. I just think it's important to, to leave your options open. You know, a lot of people don't want to take their FE early on and they're like, Oh, I don't think I'm going to want my PE, but the FE is less than an eight hour test. Um, it doesn't really take that much to, to get through it. And then you have your options open. I think that's so important is just leave your options open. Uh, just start the process. And you don't ever have to, like, if you get into your field and you decide that no one else has their PE um, and you don't want it, then that's fine. But if you don't ever, like, go through those beginning steps of getting it and making sure you're eligible, if you do want it later on, um, it can be a lot harder of a process. So just kind of leave your options open. You never know what path you're going to take and you never know where your career is going to lead you. So having, having the availability uh, is so important. Absolutely. And with that, that will mark the end of this interview. Uh, my, again, everybody, my name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Take it, take it easy, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, Brittany. Oh, thanks, Neil.